today's myth that if you are in the valley, you made a wrong turn. That means any time that we go through a long process of negativity, anything that we feel like we're in a valley about, the myth says that you have sin in your life or is your fault or you made the wrong choice. How many of you guys have been in a valley? You know, valleys are terrible. Valleys hurt. Valleys are things, a prolonged experience of something in deep pain, deep hurt. And sometimes we try to do everything within our power to get out of that valley as soon as possible. The valley is a contrast to the mountaintop experience. It represents so many things. Life is not always going to be great. It's inevitable. No matter how well you live your life, no matter how spiritual you are, you are going to go through valleys. What we do in those valleys, that contrast, we all want to live on the mountaintops. We all want to experience wonderful days. We all want to wake up excited about today. But unfortunately, sometimes we wake up not looking forward to today. Sometimes we wake up not wanting to get dressed and get out of work. Sometimes those valleys are painful. The valleys represent all kinds of low places within our life. It might be the loss of a job, problems in a relationship, struggles in a personal matter. Maybe it's financial difficulties. Maybe it's health. Health sometimes is so overwhelming and we get in this struggle, whether it's a physical health or whether it's mental health, whether it's spiritual health, Sometimes those valleys wrap up within our soul and within our mind so much that we never think that there's a way out. A good working definition. A prolonged moments of pain and suffering that we seek to escape. We seek to get out. We want to climb that mountain. But sometimes when we face the valley, sometimes when we're in the valley, what do we do? When faced with the valley that lingers, sometimes it seems like forever, we assume that God is leading us and we're trying to get out of that valley. The idea is not to try to get out of the valley. The idea that we're going to talk about today is why. What valley are we in? Why are we in that valley? And not just try to get out, but try to learn from. Proverbs 19.3 says, The foolishness of a man's twist his way. And his heart frets against the Lord. A foolishness of a man tries to twist and get his way. Tries to, tries to get out on his own knowledge. And we get upset at God because sometimes we feel like God is not listening to us because we're in this valley. That long-term valley that we feel like there's no end in sight. So what do we do? Well, if we listen to the myth of if we're in the valley, you have made a wrong turn we lose sight and we lose focus on sometimes why God wants us to be in that valley. The first problem is that important spiritual lessons are going to be ignored. If, if, you, if you believe the myth that you sinned and you're in the valley because you have sinned, we are going to lose the idea that there's a spiritual lesson and that we are ignoring what God is trying to teach us. You don't learn the really valuable lessons on the mountaintops. You learn them in the valley. In the valleys is where you see the green grass. In the valleys, you see the plush meadows. In the valleys, you get closer to the shepherd. In the valleys is when you cling on to God. In the valleys is when you fall on your knees before God and you pray and you say, why am I here? Why did this take place? And it has nothing to do with you. This may be what God is trying to get through to you. It may not be your sin. Oh, it may be. There's sometimes we are in the valleys because of what we have done. Yes. But not every valley experience is involved with sin. The second problem is that we develop a godly character and it is stunted if we believe that we are sinning to get into this valley. And sometimes God wants to create in us character. Character. When we see what God wants to do within our life, and if we just believe this valley is because of sin, and I made the wrong turn, we're not going to allow God to communicate to us. 
And I believe the third thing, the problem that we are in this valley and we believe this myth is, is we make our choices as out of, out of self-centeredness. We make our choices and our decisions thinking about me and how can I get out of this valley? Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4 says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only for your own interest, but also the interests of others. If we believe the myth, we're not going to think about anybody else. We're going to think about ourselves. But that is not the truth. The myth of the valleys is there are certain valleys that we go through. We all go through them. And the person that seems like they have no valleys to go through are the ones that are going through a valley and they're just trying to hide that they are in a valley. The results of living a spiritual life doesn't mean that you will not have valleys. You could get up and you can pray and you could read your Bible every day. It doesn't mean that you're not going to go through some valleys. I was just thinking about some valleys of people in our church just this, this week while we were preparing for this. Many of you guys have gone through some valleys. And those valleys hurt. And I prayed with you and I tried to encourage you and I tried to love for you. But the valley... You feel like you're just crawling up this mountaintop and you feel like you're staying in this valley and you don't know what to do and you don't know how to get there and, and it's overwhelming. I was thinking of John and Angie. I was thinking about their little boy Joey having leukemia. They hit a rock wall and that was a valley. We were praying for them and trying to love on them and we had no idea what Joey was going to do. And that was a valley, and, and they had no idea. But listening to their testimony now is they gave that leukemia to God. And they said, God, I want my son, but I want to do what you want me to do in everything that we do. And it was a valley. It is still a valley. It's still every day checking things out. And now he has other kinds of problems. But Joey has been given to God in the midst of leukemia. And he has been our child we have prayed for him every day. That's a valley that they are going through. I've been with you, many of you, that are going through divorce or have gone through divorce. And you're struggling. We've done counseling. And you feel like in the midst of that valley that you're going through, you say this, I, I just want to quit. Sometimes we even turn our back on God because of the valley that we're in. And that's when God says, if you turn your back on me at that time, there is no rescue. But in the midst of the valley, in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the fear of the future, is in that valley. We have to rise up our hands before God and say, God, I need you more now than I've ever needed you. I don't know what to do, and I definitely don't know what to, where to go and how to get my answers. So there are three simple questions in navigating through these valleys. And there's three valleys I want to talk about. The first valley is God sent me here valley. The God sent me here valley. That means I don't know why I'm here. I, I, I don't think I've sinned. But God put me in this valley for a particular time and a particular place for you, not against you. See, we think that I'm in this valley because God is mad. That God is trying to get something out of me. But there are times in our life that God puts us in the valley to draw closer to him. So he is preparing us for things into the future. So not every valley is a wrong turn. Some of the valleys are the perfect turn. It's the preparation stage for what God has planned for you tomorrow. But here's what we do. Because we think we're in the valley, we... We try to quit. The greatest illustration about this valley or desert time is Jesus. He was just baptized by John and he was, he was a perfect place. Even God himself opened up the heaven and said, this is my son whom I'm well pleased. Jesus is perfect. But the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan for a period of time. Now, he was doing exactly what God wanted him to do. But he was in the wilderness. 
being tempted by Satan. Satan wanted to do one thing. Satan wanted him to break God's word. If, if Satan could make him sin, he would not be the unblemished lamb that takes away the sins of the world. Jesus stood off Satan's attack. He said, get thee behind me. I am not going to lose my foundation with God because of you. There was only one person there that made the wrong turn, and it wasn't Jesus. But that one person tried to tempt Jesus into breaking what God had in store for him. He was in the valley. He was struggling. He was hurting. And then after the temptation, the angels came to minister to him, to give him strength, and he stand up to fight to start his three-year journey to redeem mankind for their sins. Was he in God's will? Absolutely. Was he in the journey? Was he in the valley? Yes, he was. The first one came immediately after his baptism. And the second thing I thought was really neat is God in his, his infinite wisdom, he had to not only teach, give G Jesus the ability to say no to Satan, but Jesus tried to teach his disciples to say no. Here's what they did. Jesus was on the mountaintop praying, and, and he said, guys, let's go on to the other side. So they got to the ship, and they was going to the other side, and Jesus was asleep in the ship. He was asleep. He was cracked. And a great, great hurricane came upon the disciples in the boat, and they were fearful. They were scared to death. They thought they were going to die. But Jesus was asleep. How could you sleep in a storm, right? There's times, there's times I'm asleep and somebody, hey, did you see the storm last night? And, nope. <laughs> I got up and it was wet. I, don't, I didn't see anything. But Jesus was asleep in the storm. Disciples woke him up. Here's what Jesus did. Shh. That's all he said. Instantaneously, the storm ceased. And the disciples, they said, wow. What is it? This man has authority. Even the winds obey him. So sometimes in the midst of the storm, when we're in the midst of the valley, when we're scared to death of tomorrow, we need to do what the disciples did. Jesus, I need your help. I'm scared to death. I have no idea what to do and where to go. But sometimes God sends me through the valley. So I can trust in him. One good thing about being in the God sent valley. Is that we're right where he wants us to be. Even if we aren't where we want to be. It may be the valley that's scary. That's even worrisome. But it's in the valley that God has prepared for us. To draw closer to him. See but what happens when we're in the God sent valley. And we rebel against that valley. There's a story of, of Jonah. God asked Jonah to go. And Jonah said, I don't want to go. So Jonah got in the boat and went away from him. And we know the story that a great fish came and swallowed Jonah and put him back over to the other shore. But when we run against what God wants us to do, God's going to put us in a valley, whether we ask him to or not, to teach us what we need to know. That valley is struggling. But then let's look at the valley Daniel Daniel was in a great valley. Daniel was just elevated up to, up to the uh, second in command. Daniel was the man at the time. And Daniel went out and he three times a day and he prayed publicly to God. But then he said, the, the, the decree came out that says no man can worship except for the king. You can't worship God. And Daniel could have said a couple things. He said, you know what, I can, I'm going to take a 30-day sabbatical for ministry. I'm going to take a 30-day time of I'm going to not pray publicly. I'm just going to go into the closet and pray. He could have made some sacrifices. He could have justifiably said, I don't care what they say. I am going to hide. But David went out the next morning. He put his mat down and he prayed unto God. And you know what Daniel had to face? He faced the lion's den. They threw him into the lion's den because he said, I am going to do what God wants me to do, not what man wants me to do. It'd be easy to sacrifice. Was he in a valley? Yeah, he was in a valley. He was facing death. But faithfully, because he did what God wanted him to do, that death became life. Even if those lions would have eaten him, 
he would have still done what God wanted him to do. But Daniel was so faithful, he said, I'm going to trust God and God alone for my life. And he did. But the valley that he was in, it was a valley that he was serving God. It wasn't because of sin. It was a valley because of God. But the second valley is the messed up valley. Anybody been in that valley? I messed up valley. It's the one valley that does mean I took the wrong turn. One good thing about this valley is we know why we're in that valley. And sometimes knowing why we're in that valley is our eye-opening experience to get out of that valley. But sometimes just because we know we're in the valley doesn't mean that we want to necessarily get out of that valley. Because get a load of this one. To get out of the valley, we got to stop doing what we did to get in the valley. You understand that? If we continue to do what we've always done, we're always going to get what we've always had. So what we have to do is, I have to be aware of why I'm in that valley, why my life is in turmoil. I messed up. I made the wrong turn. And God is saying, I know you did. You are in that valley because of your sin. But I want you to know, I am in the valley with you to make sure that I'm protecting you and I am going to confront you I'm going to convict you. I'm going to help you to get out of the valley. But you have to do a couple things to get out of that valley. The first thing, you have to take personal responsibility for your turn. You know, it's easy when somebody sins to blame somebody else for their sin. Somebody give me an amen. It's always easy to say, you made me do that. That wasn't my responsibility. You made me do it. And when we don't take personal responsibility for our sin, we are going to keep on circling the valley until we are aware that it was me. Now, I know things happen, and people sin in your life, and they cause problems in the valley in your life, and that is their issues. But when we're talking about your issue, not talking about somebody else's valley, there's plenty of valleys to go around. You need to take personal responsibility. And you have to make some serious, serious changes within your life. That's why we're in the valley sometimes. Sometimes we're aware of why we're in the valley. But sometimes we're not willing to stop the sin and to make the changes that we need to make in order to get out of the valley. Taking responsibility is the first step. I'm tired of you doing the same old thing. And God is saying, I'll stop you I love you. I'm going to walk beside you. I'm going to help you in every step of the way. But I cannot make you change. I'm not going to sit up there and say, I'm going to put a spell on you and say, you'll never sin again. You'll never make that choice again. We all have a free will and we all make those choices. What we have to do is we have to decide, is the valley where I want to be? Because if the valley is where you want to be, continue to do what you've always done. But you say, you know what? I'm tired of this valley. I want to get out of this valley, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to trust in God. And I'm going to allow God to take care of me while I'm in this valley. When I messed up valley, sometimes it's kind of like running a long distance race. I do that quite, a, you know, marathons all, I mean, every once in a while I just get up and start running a marathon, or 800 meter race or whatever the case is, just, just for the fun of it. And um, one time, two weeks ago, um, I was running this 800 meter race and uh, I was in first place by a good 20 yards. And I can't even lie very well, can I? And I fell down. I fell down and I, I was hurt, my leg hurt. But you know what? Those racers, those runners, they didn't stop to see how I was doing. They kept on going. And once I realized nobody cared that I fell down, you know what I did? I got back up. And you know what I had to do? I had to run harder, and I had to run faster just to catch up. And sometimes when we fall, we either have to make a decision. I'm going to stay down in the valley. I'm going to stay in my pity party. I've sinned. I know I've sinned. God knows I've sinned. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, I fell. I'm just going to roll off the track, and I'm going to be happy in my sin, and I'm going to say no to God. 
Or we could say this, God says, get up. You're forgiven. Go run. And sometimes, folks, it's harder to get up and to run harder and to fight. You can say, well, if, if, if I sinned and, and God forgave me, why won't he just allow me to get back in first place? <clears throat> Don't work like that, does it? When we sin and we're in that valley, we have to be aware of where we are, what we have done, and make some changes and get up, suck up, and do it right. Sometimes we just don't want to. Sometimes we don't want to work that hard. Sometimes we just say, if he would just take care of me, I'll do it. But God's saying this, I want to give you character. The valley that you're in is not for anything other than for you to draw closer to God. And when you draw closer to God, I will get you on that mountaintop experience. But the third one is this. Who knows why valley? The who knows why. I don't know why I'm here. I didn't do anything, and I, I really am not making a decision for God. I'm just in this valley. And it may be because of this sin-filled world. It may be because of other people. Maybe because your company shut down. Maybe because of relationships. And maybe because of kids. It may be that you're in a valley that you're in not control of. And you're here. And you're frustrated. And you're scared. And you're praying to God, what do I need to do? And this is the scripture that I want to give to you. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. When you're in the valley of I don't know why, when you're in the valley of circumstances outside of my control, when you're in the valley that other people put me in and it caused a situation that I really am in a long, prolonged issue in a valley and I'm scared to death and I don't know what to do, I want you to know that the good shepherd, Jesus Christ, said, I'm going to be with you in the valley. I want to learn from the valley. See, here's what Satan tries to do while we're in the valley. He tries to tempt you to get out of the valley as soon as you can. He tries to say, take the shortcut. If you can lie, lie. If you can steal, steal. Whatever it takes to get out of that valley, to make the shortcuts, take the shortcut, to get out of that valley as fast as you can. And any time that you listen to Satan and try to get out of the valley in his way, you're not learning how to get out of the valley in God's way. Ultimately, he's trying to keep Jesus out of your heart and out of your life. If we sin, when we're in the valley, we're listening. The fact are, there are three ways. Um, there are only a couple ways that we can do what God wants us to do. Number one, listen to God and the promises that he wants to give to you in the midst of the valley. And not listen to Satan to say that you're in this valley because of your sin. You're in this valley because of your life. Because here's what Satan wants you to do. This is marriage counseling. I'm applying to the valley. Satan wants to take your worst day, your worst moment, your worst fear, the lowest you could be, the angriest that you are, and he wants you to take a mental snapshot and place it on the refrigerator and say, it's not going to get any better than this. This is as good as it's going to get. This is your life. God isn't going to rescue you. This embarrassment, this negativity, this depression, this fear, this loneliness. This is what it's going to be for the rest of your life. If you want that, just stay where you are. If you want help, follow me. I'm going to take you down a path that's going to be fun. Oh, you're going to do things, experience things that you've never experienced and you're going to have a smile on your face. And he's going to walk you right up to the cliff of sin. He said, are you having fun? And what he's going to do is he's going to push you off and destroy your life. You were in the valley. But you're listening to Satan on the shortcuts. Here's what Jesus says. Stay away from the cliff. Draw to me. It's hard. But if you want life, have life more abundantly. 
focus on me and let me give to you what you cannot have on your own. So, what can I learn? Well, the first question is, where am I? The second question is, how should I respond? So the third question is, what can I learn? The valley of injustice helps us identify with suffering. The valley of pain prepares us to empathize and support others that are going through the valleys. The valley of suffering teaches us to be obedient and trust God. And the valley of self-induced hardship can serve us to know that we never want to hurt God again. But in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 5, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all men liberally, without reproach, and it will be given to him. God wants to help us. So what can we learn? The first thing is this. The first lesson that we need to learn in the valley is we can rejoice while we're in the valley. You know, we can rejoice in the valley. When we rejoice, it just means I can trust. I, I, I don't have to be in fear. When I'm in the valley, I can worship. Now, here's how we have to do that in the valley. If we are mad at God because of the valley, we're not going to rejoice God while we're in the valley. If we say, Lord, I need your help in the valley, and he rescues you from the valley, we can rejoice because we know God's hand is in our life. It depends whether we're mad at God or trusting in God. The valleys are horrible, but the valley is there for us to get closer to him. The second thing is learn to persevere. Learn to persevere. You know, we all have said it. We've all been there. Whether you're in it now or you used to be in it or you're going to go into it in the future. If we are preparing for the valley now, we can always say, God, why am I here? But I'm in the midst of it. I'm not going to get mad at God. I'm going to persevere from God. And then the third thing is, ask God for wisdom. See, the valley without God is horrendous. The valley alone is terrible. And you can name the valleys. But in that valley, we have to say this, Lord, teach me. Change my heart, oh Lord. I don't want to be in this valley by myself. I don't want to be in this valley without you. I'm not saying that valleys are good things by themselves. But I'm saying we will learn more from the valley than we will from the mountaintop. Oh, we'll talk more on the mountaintop. We'll, we'll, be, we'll have a better time on the mountaintop. But you know, you're a better person because you've been in the valley. You're more spiritual because you've been in the valley. You're going to trust God more when you're in the valley. Because God is going to rescue you from that valley and he's going to teach you, he's going to help you. And when you get out of that valley... I can worship the Lord. I can praise his name. I can fall on my knees before God and pray to him because I know he rescued me from my valley. And I was hurting. I was depressed. I was struggling. And God took me, <laughs> rescued me, and put my path on a mountaintop that I can praise God. But so often, we don't recognize God in the valley. So we don't want to praise him in the mountaintop. We think, I did this. I got a better job. I was a better parent. I did all these things, so I am better because of me. And it's not about you. You're in the valley to get closer to him, and he could change the core of your life. And when he changes the core, you know what that means? That means we can worship his name. We can change him. He can change us because we know that he is my shepherd. And if I know that he is my shepherd, I know that I can trust him. Because it's not necessarily about making a wrong turn. It's about getting in the valley, learning from the valley, 
starting on that mountaintop. My favorite chapter in the Bible. I use this probably more than any other verse or any other chapter. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. And he restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know what that means? He loves you. He's your shepherd. And if we are his sheep, we know his voice. And when we are in the valley, he is going to walk beside us. He has told us that if we have a, a sheepfold and one sheep gets lost, the good shepherd would go find that sheep and he'd call out your name and we would hear his name and we would know that he is our shepherd and we would find us. He would love us. He would pick us up. And he would carry us back to his fold. And if you're in the valley, and you feel like you are all alone, and you feel like God doesn't care, he is calling out your name. And he was saying, I want you. I love you. I want to help you. But we have to make some choices. Do I want to stay where I am? Or do I want God to rescue me and pay, take me where he wants me to go? It is our choice. So this invitation that we're about ready to experience is this. And this, you have to get rid of all your pride. If you have an issue, if you're going through a valley, maybe your kids are going through a valley, maybe somebody that you love is going through a valley, or maybe it's you going through the valley, I'm going to ask you right now to stand up, and Justin's going to lead a song about deserts and about being in a desert place. And I'm going to ask you to stand right here with your head bowed, and I want you to pray that God is going to work within your life. And then I'm going to ask you to stay here. And as a church, I want to ask our church to pray for you, for your family, for being in that desert place and being in that valley. And you're saying, Lord, I want you to get me out of this valley. But in order to get out of the valley, I want you to teach me what I need to learn. I need you to teach me what I need to do. I need you to rescue me in the midst of the valley. I want to trust in you because out of this valley, I am going to be on that mountaintop and on top of that mountaintop, I'm going to worship your name. I'm going to praise who you are and I am not going to be embarrassed of who you are because what you have done. He is my Lord. He is my Savior. Why? It's because I've been in a valley and I prayed to God and he picked me up out of that valley and I have no problem proclaiming his name. I have no problem saying, it's not me. I know it's all about him because he rescued me. He taught me. He restored me in the valley. So please stand to your feet. We sing this song. If you want to come forward, stand, pray unto God, and allow me to pray for you and with you about the valley that you're going through, the valley your family's going through, and the valley that you need to learn why you're in it to get out of it, to go to that mountaintop.